Let's look at the data. This is NASA GIST, the number of stations starting in, uh, before 1900, reached a peak in 1960. They've been closing weather stations ever since. One of the reasons they argued was because of the satellites. But the satellites can't see through cloud. It can't tell you whether it rained or snowed or whether any precipitation fell at all. In fact, you remember when the first satellite images came in, here's the satellite. They had to draw the outline of the state so you could tell what you were looking at through the cloud, okay? And, uh, but they declined. But then they reduced the number of stations, but they selected only stations that showed significant warming. And so here's the number of stations declining and then the drop in 1990, but look what happened to global temperatures. And let me show you how bad that was. Here's Canada. These diamonds are the only stations that they use to determine Canada's average temperature. Look at the Arctic. This whole Arctic archipelago, which is larger than the continental US, they got one station. For the whole of the Canadian Arctic. And I know Eureka, and I've been in there, and I've done studies with people. It's a uniquely warm spot in the Arctic. That's why they chose it. Okay, in fact, there are plants there that survived the last ice age. That's how unique it is. So when you start to look. There's a lawsuit that I've been part of in New Zealand because what every government in the world has been doing is been lowering the historic record to make the slope of the temperature increase look greater than it actually is. This is for Auckland Airport. The blue line is the actual readings. The red line is the government adjusted readings. And here you can see what they've done for the whole of New Zealand. They've done that for every single country, every record in the world. And when we brought the lawsuit against the New Zealand government, the New Zealand government said, oh yeah, we'll go to court over it. And then a week before we were going to go to court, they said, oh no, we won't go to court. We'll have a commission of inquiry. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. And who did they choose to do the commission of inquiry? The Australian Weather Bureau, <laughs> who were doing <coughs> exactly the same thing. So I just got one record here. This is Ruth Glenn. Here's the actual original, and here's the adjusted record. They've all been doing it. So they can claim that the temperature's gone up much more uh, than actually happened. The IPCC reports, um, this was in 1998. Um, and, and I hope I'm not going on too long, but it's such a long story. And, and I'm very aware that the mind can absorb what the behind can endure. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm conscious of that. But, but this, is, uh, this is one of the first bits of corruption. This is an upper atmosphere temperature record from 1955 to 1995. That's the actual record. Here's what went into their report. They selected, this was done by Benjamin Santer, the lead author. So they selected this portion, which showed an increase. They said, oh, there it is. It's warming. But look at the original record. I mean, this is so corrupt that you don't know where to start talking about it. And when, when Santer was challenged on this, this is what they had agreed to. I'll just show you. Um, I think there's three here. Yeah. If this is what they agreed to go into the report. All the scientists agreed. None of the studies cited above have shown clear evidence that we can attribute the observed causes to the specific cause of increased greenhouse gases. While some of the pattern based discussed here have claimed detection of a significant climate change, no study to date has pos positively attributed all or part of climate change to man made causes. Any claim of positive detection of attribution of significant change are likely to remain controversial until certainties in the total natural variability of the system. That's what they were going to put into the report. All of the scientists combined. Santer went off on his own, and when he submitted the report and it came out, this is what he put in there. There is evidence of an emerging pattern of climate response to forcing by greenhouse gases. Completely contradicts this. And he said, the body of statistical evidence in chapter 8, when examined in the context of our physical understanding of the climate system, now points to a discernible human influence on the global climate. But these guys said there was no evidence of that. But guess what the media picked up on? A discernible human influence. That became the headline in the New York Times. Santer, 
of course, they, oh, I'm having a nervous breakdown, I can't cope, and he went off to the Lawrence Livermore, and he's still sciencing out there. I mean, just absolutely amazing. Um, but we go back to this graph that I showed you earlier. This is the thousand years, the warming of the medieval optimum. And um, this medieval warm period, this graph created a great problem for them. Because it appeared in the first report in 1990. And it was produced by Hubert Lamb. And of course, here they were saying, this is as warm as it's ever been. And people like me were saying, well, what about the medieval warm period? It was warmer a thousand years ago. We had all this evidence to, su to support that. This is testimony from David Deming, who I've known for 30 years. This is his testimony to the US Congress, so it's given under oath. And he said, with the publication of the article in Science, I gained significant credibility in the community of scientists working on climate change. They thought I was one of them. Sounds almost paranoid, doesn't it? But I, one of them. Someone who would pervert science in the service of social and political causes. So one of them let his guard down. A major person working in the area of climate change and global warming sent me an astonishing email that said, we have to get rid of the medieval warm period. We have to rewrite history. Can you imagine? We have to rewrite history. And that's what they did. And they produced this graph, infamously called the hockey stick. Right? And, and to, to be full disclosure, the person who produced this is Michael Mann, who um, is at Penn State. He is now suing me. I have a large lawsuit against me by him um, because I showed how they corrupted the data and what they'd done. And the interviewer said, what do you think about Mr. Mann? And I flippantly said, He's at Penn State, but he should be at State Penn. <laughs> no sense of humor. No sense of humor. And, and of course, by the way, in Canada, no protection of free speech. That's why the, file, the lawsuit was filed in Canada. You would never, I would never have had the lawsuit here in the US. If you want to get a measure of how valuable your free speech is to you, Wait till you've been sued for saying something, and you find out just how nasty it is and how bad it is. I mean, it, it was a flippant comment. In fact, we've discovered since that one rap singer had already made the comment, but he didn't get sued. But what Michael Mann did was he used tree rings to produce this decline in temperature. You see the medieval warm period's gone. What's the mistake with this? Tree rings don't show temperature. They're precipitation driven. And he only selected one tree ring set, which showed the declining temperature. But then they had a problem, because the temperature on the tree rings kept going down into the 20th century. So what they did was, they cut it off at 1900, and they tacked on modern instrumental record, which is completely scientifically corrupt. And what we, we got from the leaked emails, what they were doing. The com they instructed the computer to hide the decline. That was the phrase that was used. That, oh, we can't have that decline, so we've got to hide it. So whenever the thing starts to go down, plug in this data, and that'll make it go back up again. OK? That's what went on. And two Canadians, by the name of McIntyre and McKittrick, reconstructed some of the data. And of course, there the, the medieval warm period shows up again. And here you can see. But look at this blade of the hockey stick. That's instrumental record. This was produced by Phil Jones at the University of East Anglia, who was heavily involved in this corruption. And he, he claimed the global average surface temperature increased by 0.6 to plus or minus 0.2 in the late 19th century. So the temperature went up 0.6 degrees in about 120 years. That's what he claimed. But look at this. 0.6 degrees plus or minus 0.2. This is a range of error of plus or minus 33%. It's meaningless. It's like the, it's like the radio station. So we've done a poll for this, for this vote coming up, and it's accurate to within plus or minus 33%. But that's in the official report. It's in the official report. And when the Australian 
Warwick Hughes, the Australian climatologist, sent, to, sent an email to Jones and said, he asked for the data. He said, show us the data. How did you get this uh, blade of the hockey stick? And this is what Jones replied. We have 25 years or so invested in the work. Why should I make the data available to you when your aim is to try and find something wrong with it? <laughs> I mean, people don't believe that this is going on about amongst world-class scientists. That's the problem. You know, it's almost like the priest thing that you don't, you can't believe, and you don't want to believe. But that's the difficulty, and and so of of course. And by the way, fine, and in the, in the leaked emails, Jones is saying, I hope they don't find out that they can get the data through freedom of information. And so they found different ways to hide the data. Finally, they, they got pushed hard enough, and oh, lo and behold, Mr. Jones lost his data. He lost his data, okay? And Michael Mann, of course, is now refusing to disclose his calculations of how he made the hockey stick. All right? He's refusing to disclose it. And uh, you remember the old math exam in school? Show your work. Show your work, right? Because you might have cheated from your neighbor, right? Very quickly at the end here, omissions. Uh, in the computer models, they leave out so much because they're only looking at human causes. I don't know how many in the room know this. This is called the Milankovitch effect. We've known about it since 1863, or most of it, the orbit of the Earth around the Sun changes from almost circular to extreme ellipse. That's going on all the time, a constant changing, caused by the gravitational pull of the planet Jupiter, okay, or primarily by that. The tilt of the Earth is constantly changing from 24.5 to 21.9. Tilt's constantly changing. We tell everybody it's 23 and a half degrees, but that's just close enough for government work. Change, change the tilt by one degree and think what happens to the latitudes of you know, the Arctic Circle, Antarctic Circle, the tropics. The whole distribution of energy changes. And then what's called the precession of the equinox, the day on which the, the days and nights are equal length, is constantly changing. And you want proof of that? We have to keep upgrading our calendars because they're fixed and nature isn't. If you go back and look at the Hudson Bay Company journals in Winnipeg, and you look at September the 3rd is followed, or September the 2nd is followed by September the 13th. The government of Britain in 1752 ordered to add 11 days to the calendar. Okay, there were riots in Britain. People died in the riots in Britain, and because people thought the government had shortened their lives by 11 days. <laughs> Incidentally, I was teaching a course, and I was talking about this in, in a penitentiary in Canada, because I wanted to have a captive audience for a few years. <laughs> and I was telling them about how this year got shortened by 11 days, and I said everybody was angry, and one of the prisoners said, I know a group that weren't. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, all relative, isn't it? And, and, and so all of these changes are going on all of the time. They're not included in their computer model. Because they say, oh, they, these are long-term changes. No, every single year the tilt's changing. Every single year the orbit's changing. And you're telling me this is a forecast for 100 years. This is significant, but they don't include it. And they don't include this. They don't include the fact that cosmic radiation from the sun, the amount reaching the Earth, is determined by the strength of the sun's magnetic field. And so as the sun's magnetic field strength changes, cosmic radiation reaching the lower atmosphere determines the amount of cloud cover on the Earth. So it's like putting up a screen in the greenhouse. And I'll show you just this one graph. The blue is the low cloud cover, and here's the cosmic radiation variation. None of this is included in their computer models, yet we've known about it since 1991. These are major, major causes of controls of climate change, not included in their computer models. Um, the, we've known for decades uh, about sunspot numbers, and of course, remember I showed you that little ice age? This is another painting. This is uh, called The Great Frost by Jan Griffier, and it's the Thames in 1683. You see uh, down the middle of the Thames a, a medieval ice fair. 
Queen Elizabeth and her court skated regularly on the Thames. And um, you can see uh, St. Paul's Cathedral here, Westminster Abbey, Lambeth Palace. And again, the ice, as I said, was three foot thick that particular year. There's a coach and four horses out on the ice, so it gives you an idea. Uh, now, the last time that you had ice of any significance on the Thames was in 1836. Some wag has said that the Thames doesn't freeze over anymore because they built the Houses of Parliament here and the hot air from the politicians. <laughs> is but the correlation between sunspot numbers and global temperature is, of course, because of the cloud cover and the sun's magnetic region. None of this is included in their climate models. The current situation is, here's cycle 23, 2010. We're, we're down to sunspot numbers this year comparable to around 1800. And uh, so, of course, the Earth is cooling down. We'll continue to cool down because the sunspot numbers are declining. Solar activity is declining. And, and uh, we're expecting that to, to cool to at least till 2037. But what's the government doing? Preparing you for warming. Exactly the wrong direction. They're better to do nothing. Actually, that sounds good for government. <laughs> and so we end up with this situation. These are two cavemen. And it, I'll read the caption. It says, something's just not right. Our air is clean. Our water is pure. We all get plenty of exercise. Everything we eat is organic and free range. And yet nobody lives past 30. <laughs> Kind of sums it up, doesn't it? Kind of <laughs> sums it up. But of course, uh, a lot of people want to go back to this, these conditions. I can tell you, having talked with Aboriginal peace, people all across Canada, the elders, they say, you're crazy? <laughs> the good old times? No, it never existed. And, and maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe we have become so successful, we've become complacency, complacent in what I call the complacency of superabundance that people can't imagine shortages. They can't imagine being without. And it, it was brought home to me one evening when our power went off and my children said, we're going to go down to the basement and watch television till the power comes back <laughs> on. <again." laughs> it is at that level of detachment for the young people, unfortunately. It really is. And so, as I say, I've, I've summarized all this. And I'm very grateful to Ken Kaufman, my publisher here in Mount Vernon has helped uh, with me and, it, and his good daughter, Stacy with this uh, book, The Deliberate Corruption of Climate Science. But I hope I've given you a, a brief insight there. I mean, there are so many other stories of corruption and misdirection, but at least it gives you an idea of why I talk about the deliberate corruption of science, because that's what it is. It's premeditated. And just like with murders, murders of passion are one thing, but premeditated murders are a t completely different situation. So for that, I thank you for inviting me, and I thank you for your attention.